Well, the obvious first point to make is that God has never been so popular at a meeting like this. <laughs> Uh, which is rather alarming, actually. It wasn't really intention when I thought about this. Now, this is inevitably an experimental meeting, and I do believe that history can be, even religious history, can be judged scientifically. So I'm going to be presenting a series of hypotheses, and uh, you are my peers, so I'm expecting some peer review at the end, and you can comment on whether you think I got some of this right or whether I didn't. Now, a number of other sort of preliminary remarks before I get into the kind of the nitty-gritty of this. Um, first of all, you'll see next to my book, another book, and I did indeed adapt the title for this talk from that title, The History of God by Karen Armstrong. She's a religious writer, she's not an atheist, but I find this book extremely useful, and one of the things I'm doing, trying to, is to adapt her book along Marxist lines. There's some fantastically interesting history in that book, and there's another point here, is that although she doesn't call herself an atheist, she's a not a terribly convincing believer uh, and that's what makes her book interesting. And you have the sense in which it's a, she's, she's part of a disintegrating ideology. And people on the inside of disintegrating ideologies are sometimes very effective in providing us on the outside with insights. She's one person I'm doing this with. Another one I'll mention several times is an Israeli archaeologist called Israel Finkelstein, who more or less wrote, unrealizingly, inadvertently, the first chapter of the myths of Zionism. Someone has done more in some ways to destroy the biblical foundations of Zionism than many anti -Zionists. So there's an important principle here. So that's the first uh, point. The second point I want to make is, I'm really only dealing with a Middle East God. Uh, sometimes we call these the Abrahamic religions, the, 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 the God of uh, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, and really on the grounds that he's the most mischievous, he's the most, he's the most successful, he's also caused most problems, just in terms of the scale of supporters he's let down over the centuries uh, in most parts of the world now. So I think that's an important consideration also to bear in mind. Um, I won't be mentioning the Dawkins-Hitchens line, but no doubt people want to bring up those two uh, gentlemen from the floor. I regard their version of atheism as quite unhelpful. That intense hostility to religion is not the way to deal with religion. I hope that point comes out in the course of the discussion. Now, there are several other points which escape me. One of, one of the important things I will be doing, I'll be dealing with turning points. Loosely speaking, this is a slightly over, slight overstatement, I'll be, dealing, I'll be dealing with two turning points, probably about 15 minutes each. Many gods to one god, and one god to no gods. And as Alex Kalinkos has pointed out to me, we aren't quite there yet with no god, but the point I will be making is that it does begin to change significantly, radically, uh, about the 16th century with the uh, Renaissance, Reformation, Enlightenment. That's going to be an, an, an important turning point. Two turning points, in other words, are the focus of the discussion, and I'll kind of build an argument around that. Now, having said that, let's get into the nitty-gritty. Um, you probably can't see the front cover of my book, but those of you who are familiar with it will know the front cover is quite an extraordinary photograph of a synagogue floor in ancient Roman Palestine. On that synagogue floor, there is the Torah shrine, Moses and the Ten Commandments, etc., but also a zodiac sun god. When I first discovered this, I was incredibly fascinated by it. And here on the front cover of my book is the polemical point against Zionism, making the point that Jews and non-Jews even maybe worship together, given the proximity of these two very different religious symbols on a synagogue floor. But after I wrote the book, I got very fascinated by this and went back to northern Palestine, Israel, to research it more. And to my amazement, I discovered there are these synagogue floors all over the place, at least six, and many of them around the Sea of Galilee. Now, this is a risky bit of my talk, but I'm going to do it anyway. If you've ever been near the Sea of Galilee, um, and you've been the hills above the Galilee, at sunrise, and by the way, from one sun god floor to another sun god floor, there's a walk from near Nazareth to uh, the city of Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee. If you're present for the sunrise, as the sun appears to come out of the Sea of Galilee in a kind of shivering, shimmering haze, I challenge any atheist in the room not to go there and be moved for at least a second or two to be kind of <laughs> shaken by this extraordinary experience. Now, if a 21st century hard-bitten Marxist atheist can feel slightly, uh, you know, a bit wobbly, given this site, <laughs> I can assure you it's very likely that the uh, peasant agricult agriculturalists of two to three, four thousand years ago were m even more moved. And there's something terribly important symbolically about this, this mixture, this kind of momentarily mixture symbolically, but also in reality of sun and water, this is a life-giving force an amazingly powerful life-giving force. 
What an enormously rational perspective to worship the sun. Why wouldn't you? Sun worship has been incredibly dominant. I've discovered about Judaism, absolutely extraordinary. Sun worship has been associated with Judaism for an enormously long time. Clearly, towards the end of the kind of so-called ancient period, it's actually on the synagogue floors. But there was a, a particularly obnoxious Israeli um, politician called Abba Eban, who fancies himself as a classic scholar. And he was one of the first, and, 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 and Israeli archaeology is very interesting on in this subject, because on the one hand they want to justify Zionism, but there are many serious archaeologists, and they get themselves into a fantastic muddle. One of the muddles they got themselves into was recognising a link between one of the late, late pharaohs, Akhenaten, who was a sun god worshipper, and this is one of the big Bronze Age empires, and more about that in a moment, and the, and the Moses story. And Abba Iban in a TV programme for Channel 4 News in the 80s, made a, 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 lot, a lot of, uh, a, gave a lot of background to his argument. And it's generally, it's, I don't, don't want to say there's a scholarly consensus. This subject is short on scholarly consensus, given the nature of the material. But there are many serious scholars who do make this connection uh, between the Moses story and sun god worship and monotheism. And one of the points being, Archonaton had a big empire, it, it made it much easier to control the empire to find a common god. And the sun was an obviously common god, and given the enormous power of the sun, etc., etc., so it did make a, a lot of sense. But of course, what we're really saying here is that in this kind of many god period, we have nature playing a decisive role. And that's what we're really talking about. We are talking about nature's gods. One of the points I wanted to say earlier on. I'm mentioning Karen Armstrong's book, but I also want to say, and this is a very serious point, this is partly, in my view, a tribute to the late Chris Harmon. Many of the insights for this meeting come from Chris's book, A People's History. And there's a fabulous section talking about nature's gods, there's a fabulous section in Chris's book, where he's describing the fusion of astronomy and astrology in ancient Babylon. And he describes the way, on the one hand, there's the magic associated with astrology. And by the way, I won't embarrass anyone in the room, but I bet there's very many people who have a sneaky look from time to time at their star signs. I bet one or two of you do. And if you are foolish enough to do that in the 21st century, just think it's lasted all that time, this whole notion of reading the future in the stars. But of course, a much more serious point that Chris makes is that those peasant, very sophisticated peasant farmers were able to read the rhythms of the seasons in the stars. And that was incredibly important in terms of pot, uh, plant crop uh, 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 planting and formation and so on. So the astrology, astronomy, stars played an important part of, uh, 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 of nature's gods. So, of course, did the moon. And so, of course, did the storm god Baal. And I just want to mention this, and there's many, many other nature's gods, but the, what's interesting about the storm god Baal, it was a Canaanite Palestinian god. When you, and I, I don't pretend to do this, but I've, I've read people who've learnt to read the Old Testament really carefully, who are trained in the archaeology and the non-biblical history of the period, and can read the way that in part the Old Testament is a struggle between different gods. The Yahweh of the Jewish God only becomes a Jewish God many, many centuries afterwards. The period that describing the so-called ancient states of Judah and, 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 uh, uh, and Israel are pagan states. And they're struggling over different gods, of which Baal is an important part of what they call the pantheon, the hi hierarchy of gods, which has Yahweh as only one of, of, of many gods. Nature's gods, many gods. Let's just stay, however, with the sun god, because the sun god is a very useful way into how we move from many gods to one god. I've mentioned already Archonaton, and I've mentioned the, the synagogue floors, but there's perhaps an even more important example. One of the great discoveries, archaeolo uh, archaeological discoveries, which was brought from the Louvre in Paris to the British Museum for their Babylon exhibition, is the Harampai Code. This is the great Babylonian ruler of approximately 4,000 years ago. This is a law code uh, in black stone, which many Jewish scholars see as a kind of one, of one of the links to the Ten Commandments. But the God that's giving the Babylonian ruler this law and justice code is a sun god, Shamash. And I'm going to come back to the Babylonian experience in a moment. There's still a history waiting to be fully untapped in terms of that marvellous Mesopotamian tradition. But here's another link to the sun god. But very, very finally, in our own British Museum, there's an extraordinary black obelisk uh, a statue, set of statues, and you've got bent double. Literally, it's the, it's the, it's the centrepiece in their Assyrian exhibition. Bent double, you have a pagan Israeli king paying tribute to an Assyrian king, and they've both got sun discs above their head. Now, not everyone agrees these are sun gods, but there's a, there's a, there's a very strong scholarly there's a very strong scholarly view. I won't say it's a consensus scholarly view that they are. Now, this is a very important connection. I want to develop this a little bit further. The the connection 
between these nature's gods and one god is brought together very effectively by this Israeli archaeologist, Israel Finkelstein. I mentioned him before, and I mentioned him in my book, and he forms a chapter in my book where I, where he, where I use him to take to pieces the whole idea of the uh, pagan states of, of Israel and Judah, and the whole idea there was a united monarchy. Um, but Israel Finkelstein has now written a follow-up book called David and Solomon, and he makes the most remarkable point. He's, he's posing the question, having destroyed the argument there was something called King Solomon's Temple. He's got a very simple argument saying, with all of these genuinely powerful ancient temples, there's always been a literary record discovered in the ground. Now, the, if the, Israeli, if the Israelis are nothing else. They're very good archaeologists. They've been digging the ground for this temple for 100 years. They can't find it. Israel Finkelstein, on behalf of a minority of Israeli archaeologists, has said now, we can't find it. That's the end of the matter. We can't find the literary record associated with it. In his latest book, he asked the question, we have to answer why in Kings in the Old Testament we have such a detailed discussion of uh, King Solomon's temple. Some kind of temple is being discussed. The level of detail is so phenomenal. He now concludes it's an Assyrian temple. Now, this is incredibly important. The whole argument about Assyria, there are three great empires following the last of that great Egyptian empire in Mesopotamia, based on the Fertile Crescent, on the Tigris and Euphrates. Assyria, Babylon and Persia. And they both more or less tumble over each other. They're all central, if you remember the Old Testament story, to the Old Testament story. Well, for Israel Finkelstein now, his argument is, Assyria gets a very bad reputation, both in the Bible and in the museums, as being a completely sadistic, uh, a bloodthirsty empire uh, uh, with no culture whatsoever. Now, it was certainly a bloodthirsty empire, there's no doubt about that. But the culture is much richer than uh, we've been previously led to believe. And the, the culture, of course, depends on this very long Mesopotamian history. If you think about Western European culture and the richness that we're all lucky enough to be take part of, five or six hundred years in terms of its intensity, that Mesopotamian culture is actually 4,000 years old. It's very, very rich culture. The cuneiform culture, the, the, it's a literate culture going back several thousand years, the cuneiform clay culture. And Finkelstein and other writers, not just him, there's not now quite a, a large number of writers who are now writing about this earlier Babylonian history. And they also begin to show the way in which a kind of monotheism begins to develop. There's a kind of merging of many gods into one god. But there's something else taking place. And this is, this is, this is where the Karen Armstrong book is very interesting. Something begins to happen roughly uh, 2,800 years ago. Something that begins to change. Some, some of these writers, religious writers, call it the Axial Age. Chris Harmony's book, the opening chapter is called Iron and Empire. And those two words sum it up. The key change that takes place is a change in technology. It's a change from bronze to iron. Iron has an enormously important levelling effect. Now, I was, I, I'm dropping quotes because of the time problem. There's some fa fabulous quotes in many of the books I'm referring to. I'm just going to quickly summarise them. The excellent quotes in Chris's chapter. I'm just going to summarise one of the points, several of the points that Chris makes. And this is, this, is, this is more or less a scholarly consensus. Chris leans heavily, by the way, on a famous Marxist Australian archaeologist called Gordon C. Child, who wrote a brilliant book. It's still available in Penguin, What Happened in History. Chris heavily draws on this. And he makes the point that iron made cheap tools available for the peasantry for the first time. It made the prospect of an independent peasantry a plausible, a, a pressure, a movement of pressure, a movement of some kind of rudimentary democratisation on auto autocratic rulers. And this plays its own part in beginning to sh reshape the ideologies. All sorts of other factors are at play. But one of the factors that are at play is that iron makes not just these tools much cheaper, it also makes them much more effective. Forest clearing becomes far more effective, and the empires that develop become much more sophisticated. And we've got these three empires. And one of the causes of the move towards monotheism, not the only one, is how useful to have a single god that uh, rules over all the peoples in these empires. Because, of course, you aren't talking about ethnic, ethnic majorities. There's all sorts of very rich ethnic minorities inside these empires. The Assyrians began a process of deportation to break resistance when they went into other, uh, when they expanded their, their borders and, and, and took people uh, back to their own cities, but in the process tried to create this kind of common culture. But there's something else that's going on, and this is quite complicated to get across. There is a kind of religious ideological shift, and it's very complicated, and I can't do it justice. I'm just going to try and, try and do it literally in a couple of minutes. The, the significant shift from polytheism to monotheism, and I hate the word paganism, from many gods to, 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 to a single god. And the single most important point is this move away from nature, is that for the first time you get the idea that 
that God isn't simply associated with nature. God is separate from nature. God is greater than nature. I won't quote Genesis, but there's lots of parts of Genesis with a whole argument about God creating the heavens and the earth, God's creating all the, all the creatures, not just the human creatures. But this, my goodness, this, 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 this process is that the, the maker, and, let's, and some would regard him as a prime mover, is beyond nature, is greater than nature. But there's a peculiar factor about this. About this. This, this and is more remote from nature, and in some sense more remote from humans. But there's a peculiar twist to this story, is that being more remote from humans, but also, at least for some parts, for some monotheists, he's also created human beings in his own image. And there's, a, there's an intense contradiction here that makes, as a matter of fact, the whole process of this belief quite unstable. But the critical point, the absolute critical point, is around this period, and it's dated roughly from 18, 28, uh, 20, uh, 2,800 years ago, 2,200 years ago, roughly, in other words, two, 200 years roughly before the start of the so-called Christian era, you've got this significant change to one God. Now, um, I'm already halfway, so I'm actually going to skip bits. Uh, this, is, this was inevitable. And uh, I'm sorry to say that I can only give um, two, uh, one minute to Christianity and two minutes to Islam. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, 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 I want to give you just two facts about both. I'm not going to say it's the most important thing to remember about these religions, but it's one very important point. One very important point to remember about Christianity in Palestine 2,000 years ago, it was built on rapidly expanding Jewish communities. It's a terribly important point. Chris Harmon does it brilliantly in his book, by the way. The, con the conversions are partly based on those communities, and the Roman Empire was already threatened by this Judaism, but the, but the, but the rules and restrictions of Judaism were too narrowly based. That doesn't fully explain the Messiah story. I'm going to be really crude here. It does strike me, however, the Messiah story, the fact that Messiah, Messiah has been and gone is far more attractive in Christianity, the idea that the Messiah is still to come. Uh, but in any event, we get the Messiah story wrapped up with the birth of Christianity. Islam, the, the point I want to make about Islam, and in all sense the religions are, these three monotheistic religions in the Middle East are clearly interconnected. But one point I want to make about Islam, I said... Let's just find one really important fact that perhaps you don't know. I didn't know this properly until I began to research this. Is that, is that it's not just that Islam gets a really bad history in the West and a bad press. Actually, in some ways, just as important, the pre-Arabic, the pre-Islamic Arabic culture also gets a very bad history. It's a very rich culture. For example, the Hajj and many of the, the Islamic rituals in Mecca were actually adaptations of a rich, many gods, polytheistic Arab culture. It was many centuries old. And again, I haven't got time to do this justice. One of um, Israel Finkelstein's most brilliant points about Assyria is his analysis of the visit of the Queen of Sheba, an Arab queen, that's also recorded in, as in, uh, on Assyrian cuneiform tablets. And the point he wants to make is the richness of this Arabic culture. And this is all credit to this Israeli archaeologist for making this point. And it forces us to revisit the symbolism of the whole Abraham, Israel, Ishmael story. I'm not even going to attempt to do that now. It's not been done properly. But it's, it's, it's important to understand that it's 10 centuries before Islam, we have a very, very rich Arabic culture. And very finally, before I move to uh, a, 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 more, a more recent period, I want to mention Aristotle. And again, just only one or two minutes for Aristotle. Uh, Karen Armstrong regards him as the first monotheist. I think that's actually doing him an injustice. It's fantastically interesting how sophisticated Aristotle was. It's not just that he was a monotheist. He goes beyond that. I mentioned the phrase the prime mover. Aristotle goes beyond the ideas of prime mover. There isn't a prime mover. Once you say there isn't a prime mover, I mean, the Greeks understood some kind of notion of cause and effect, including with their gods. But there's some notion that Aristotle that you can investigate nature and get explanations and find things out about how the world works. But, but for most believers, there's a prime move of Aristotle. There isn't a prime move, and there's a PhD. Maybe it's already been done. It seems to me Aristotle's religious system is not so different to Spinoza's, Spinoza's religious system. Because they both don't completely break with religion, but at the same time, they both deny the existence of a prime move. And that's terribly close to an atheistic position. That concludes the first half of my talk. Now, the second half of my talk is even more adventurous, and uh, this is really a, a gamble by me. I'm going to open it with this uh, astonishing claim. You've all heard of the Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown's brilliant pop novel about uh, Leonardo da Vinci and the uh, painting The Virgin of the Rocks in Paris. Well, I claim to have discovered the real code, and I claim to have found a way of cracking it. <laughs> and the reason I got to this position and, uh, is, is the follows. 
is, is, is following. Um, Karen Armstrong makes a fascinating point. She's asking the question about religious creativity. And she says, in her view, religious creativity and artistic creativity have a common root. She talks about the way, in many religions, the prophets get a, hear, hear a voice and get a calling. She says, that's what poets do. That's what painters do. They hear voices, but they aren't crazy. It's just that, that, that some, it's their creative moment in their sub subconscious is coming through to their conscious. It's a very cleverly written part of that book, and I can't do it justice. But it occurred to me, what happens if that's true, when art and religion collide? And I think you could make a claim that art and religion do collide with the Renaissance. And here I want to quote Engels. I'm avoiding looking at my notes. This is, this is more or less from memory. Engels describing this period, talking about Renaissance, Reformation, Enlightenment, as the kind of moment when one God becomes none. Well, actually, that's not quite true, because clearly God hasn't entirely left our lives, but there's a significant change. The, the beginnings of the end of God is probably this period, uh, 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 which begins with the Renaissance, Reformation, Enlightenment. In any case, Engels said about this period, it's the moment at which, and I tried to quote it exactly as possible, it's the moment at which the dictatorship of the church over human beings' minds is shattered. And he said it's a great moment, and there are giants that take us there. And the greatest giant of them all is Leonardo da Vinci. And he's the greatest giant of them all because he's simultaneously an artist and a scientist. Now, um, I went to the Leonardo exhibition a few months ago, maybe some of you did too, and I knew nothing about Leonardo, but I had this idea in my mind, and I was completely shocked to discover the exhibition was absolutely overwhelmed with Virgin Marys, with baby Jesuses, with baby John the Baptists, with, with angels and so on. And I was quite shaken. How can it be that Leonardo is this painter of Christianity at the same time opens the way for a, a secular view. How can this be? And I began to think about this and I bought the catalogue and began to talk to various people and do a little bit of research. And um, I'm now going to put, put forward my most problematic hypothesis, which is this. Uh, the, uh, you may know there are two paintings of the Virgin of the Rocks. By the way, the Virgin is the Virgin Mary. And, uh, and I'm sure you all know the story. But the commissioning paymasters of Leonardo when he did the painting believed that God planned what's called the Immaculate Conception, the Virgin Birth, before the beginning of time. And Leonardo, I'm absolutely certain Leonardo also believed this. And he set out to capture this in paint, so the argument goes. And uh, the reason why there are two paintings, so the argument goes, that in the painting that's in the... In, in, they got the two paintings together at the National Gallery, but one's in the Louvre normally, and one's in the, uh, in the, in the London Museum. In the Louvre, he captures in paint... But it's naturalism he captures. He captures the beauty of nature, and it's magnificent, so the argument goes, but it's not quite as good as the London painting, where he gets inside God's mind and captures something called divine grace, which is beyond nature, which is greater than nature, which is what God was planning for human beings, or at least planning uh, that the, the God's, God's son at least take onto, onto the earth. Now, if you notice in this story, the London painting is rather better than the Paris painting. And uh, John Berger, the great art historian, poked the National Gallery 40 years over this for trying to privilege the London painting over the Paris painting. Now, I've got no idea at all what the truth is about this, but doing a little bit of research, to my amazement, the London catalogue has a reference to the geological genius of Leonardo when he did the painting of the Virgin of the Rocks. Just, you don't even know, need to know the painting. Just the title is enough for this meeting in 35 minutes that the Virgin and the Rocks have equal billing. Actually, in the painting, the Rocks takes up more space than Mary and the, the baby Jesus and the baby John the Baptist and the angel. And according to the National Gallery's own catalogue, its reference says that the, geo, the, the, the geological genius of Leonardo is built in to the way he paints the rocks. What's more, there is vegetation, and the Guardian's art correspondent says there's a fossil record also buried in the Louvre version. Now, this is completely bizarre, and it's not entirely relevant, but um, it's also said about, the, about the, the Leonardo version in London that, on the one hand, Leonardo's going, going beyond this, but because his geological genius is missing in the London version, probably the London version isn't authentic. Now, I'm not interested whether it's true or false. I'm very fascinated in what is an expert view. It's not just the Guardian's art correspondent. It's also, to their credit, the National Gallery's own catalogue has a reference which says Leonardo's geological genius is on display in, that, uh, in, the, in the Louvre version. 
And the Guardian's correspondent pushes this a bit further. He says, it's not just that there's vegetation on the rocks, it's not just that there's a fossil record present, he's saying, as a matter of fact, um, uh, Leonardo is beginning to anticipate Darwin. And the, and the problem is this, the argument is this, if the idea is the painting is planned before the beginning of time, he's making an, a, an unspoken distinction between human time and geological time. And the rocks there are clearly in geological time, and what this does, it blasts a hole through the whole story of Genesis, i.e. God created the heavens and the earth in seven days. Now, everyone in this room may regard that as old hat, and of course, we take that for granted. But five centuries ago, they didn't take it for granted. It's, it's relatively recently, the Bible stories were taken to pieces as being real history, my point about this is that Leonardo is making a fantastically important unintended claim that the story in Genesis cannot possibly be true. And I think that's an incredibly important argument. And this has been a way of trying to illustrate the point through painting, but of course there's lots of different ways you could illustrate this very same point, that science is a driver, even in art, it's a driver that begins to shape belief. Now, there's a more standard way of doing this. And it's worth mentioning the more standard ways of doing this. Of course, when we start talking about the Enlightenment and great science, Copernicus and Galileo, by the way, both believers, when they realised that the Earth wasn't the centre of the universe, when they realised that the Earth goes round the sun and not the other way around, the Pope locked Galileo up for his investigations. That began, as many of these discoveries did, the shattering of God's authority. And of course, at the other end of our story, we have Darwin. Also, by the way, Darwin did not completely break with Christianity. In fact, I think I'm right in saying it took him 20 years before he published his, evolu his finding on evolution. Of course, that's the standard way of making this point, but I thought this Leonardo story was a particularly interesting way of doing it, especially given this earlier argument about the link between artistic creativity and religious creativity. Now, this has gone far better than I was expecting in terms of <laughs> timing. And so I do want to just uh, begin to draw my remarks to a close with one or two quotations, um, which I do think are very helpful to us here. Um, I was quite struck by... Let me just tell you what the, Gu the Guardian's art correspondence said. I think it's very interesting. As a geologist, Leonardo anticipated the scientists of the 18th and 19th centuries who were to prove that the world is far older than the book of Genesis. When the scientific pioneers around 1800 recognised fossils for what they are, traces of ancient animals, and analysed the processes that create and erode rocks, they quickly reached a set of conclusions that led to Darwin's theory of evolution, the crisis for Christianity. But amazingly, a self-taught researcher, Leonardo, thought through a lot of their key discoveries a hundred years earlier. He didn't merely think about these things in the abstract, he did real research. When he lived in Milan as a court artist, he was conveniently close to the Alps. He writes in his notes about exploring a mountain cave, where he found massive fossil bones. I just think that's completely fascinating about the man. And he's a court artist. He's being paid to write this extraordinary religious mumbo-jumbo. At the same time, he's in, he's in the mountains doing very serious scientific investigation. I just think that's completely fascinating, this kind of fusion of art and science, which is why, quite rightly, um, Engels praised him in the way that Engels did praise him. Um, I've actually gone more quickly than I intended, uh, which is no problem at all. It's going to be about 30 minutes, but I do have two wonderful quotes, which is also slightly problematic, but here we go. Let's risk this one as well. I got very interested in the idea of divine grace that Leonardo was apparently trying to achieve in the London painting. And um, I was thinking about how to conclude this talk, and it struck me there's only one way to conclude a talk like this in a festival called the Marxism Festival, and it's to turn to Leon Trotsky's writing about art and literature. And Trotsky asks the question, how do we judge these great Renaissance artists? And how do we generally judge great artists, but the Renaissance artists in particular? And he writes the following thing. He writes, works of art developed in a medieval city and they can affect us too over the centuries. It requires that these feelings and moods shall have received such broad, intense, powerful expression as to have raised them above the limitations of life in those days. Across six centuries, this takes on new meaning. We can abandon, and this is, I'm putting a, 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 a commentary on this myself here, we can abandon the superstition of the virgin birth, but be equally overwhelmed with the beauty of the natural setting that Leonardo imagined he had found here on planet Earth, but before the dawn of humanity. But can we also relate to divine grace, this concept, and strip it of its divinity? And to my amazement, Trotsky, I think, thinks that we can, and he says this, 
when in this passage he's writing about, he introduces the idea of the sublime. And um, this is a, a strange concept in many ways, the sublime. It's one that, how often do we use this word ourselves? I suggest hardly ever, if at all. But Trotsky frees it of his theological trappings, and he says that art itself can impart these qualities once we've freed ourselves from the oppressive and exploitative economic and political structures. And to quote directly, he says, all the arts, he's talking about a future, but here on this planet, not in heaven, ordinary human beings having changed the world that we live in, all the arts will impart a sublime form. We'll grow stronger, wiser, subtler. The forms of our existence will acquire a dynamic artistic quality of their own. I think that's an absolutely wonderful quote. And it does what Marxists always try to do with religion. I think in a, in a sensitive way, that we aren't, in quotes, against religion, but we recognise its limitations. We are, like Marx said, and let's come back to the whole question of looking for a spirit in the world without spirit, we're looking for a way, looking to try to understand what religion is trying to do. And when I said earlier on that one of the problems with monotheism, once it begins the idea that God created human beings in his image, it, doesn't, it makes the reversal of that process not that difficult to bring about. That's essentially what Trotsky is trying to say, and that the spirit is our creative spirit, constantly trying to improve ourselves, not just individuals, but as a collective, to try to change the world that we're living in to make it a much better place. Thank you. I'm feeling a bit brave here. Um, I want to talk about the deeper God, uh, not the God of the head and of religions and institutions, but the God that's about faith and what goes inside the heart and link it to some of what you've uh, said. Um, there's a book by G.K. Chesterton, you know, who wrote the Father Brown stories. And it's an interesting book because he talks about the polytheism and monotheism. And he says he rejects that view of history, that you first had your polytheism, then you had monotheism. He actually talks about there always being a sense in human beings of something that's deeper and bigger than anything that they they can understand and that there's a deeper meaning in life that they're looking for and that you had both at the same time um, and that a lot of the polytheism wasn't kind of serious uh, faith in the sense that these were gods who, who sat down and had affairs with people and, and ate with people and so on and that there was always that kind of deeper, more meaningful God. So I think that's one view of the history of God that's worth looking at. The next thing is a theologian called Paul Tillich, who was, uh, he became very popular in America after the Second World War. And what had happened uh, with fascism and, and the two world wars was people were really struggling with their faith and there was a big rejection of God. People know that you had John Paul Sartre, you had existentialism and everything else. People were rejecting God because they'd had this simplistic view of God that he would make everything better. And they were living in this awful, harsh world where things weren't getting better. And they were saying, where is God in all this? I mean, people remember the stories from the Holocaust of, of people just saying, where is God in the midst of all this uh, horror? And one of the reasons Tillich was able to connect with people was he talked about this situation where all God has gone from the world and, and there is no faith left. And then somehow, beyond all that and beyond that distance, a god comes bouncing back into uh, the world that gives it its meaning again. And but he's not there to make a better, you know, he's not there to make a better place. It is a dark and difficult world. And he, he went around America preaching, yes, it is a dark and difficult world. But there's someone who's serving your sharing your suffering. And that's when the power of the cross and what that really meant to people who anyone who's been through a hard time, anyone who's faced death in their family, you find that the answers in the world, you know, that you're getting books and so on aren't there anymore. So I just think you have to have an open mind about about those bigger things inside of humans that, that, that we search for and yearn for. Now, my final point is, um, I think it is okay for Marxists to, uh, to look for God and be open to that. I don't think we do have to be atheists. I think the fact that Marx was an atheist and had a, had a personal conversion or encounter with God 
doesn't mean the rest of us can't. I was an atheist for a long, long time. I am now a Christian. I don't think it stops me being a socialist. It doesn't stop me fighting for justice. I think all of our ideas for justice and equality and everything else comes from God. So I think it is okay. After, I'm a very logical person. I'm a scientist. I'm a power engineer. But I think it is okay. If you have a personal faith and want to love God, I think you're perfectly free to do so, you can still carry on your politics, but you are free to do that spiritual searching. And there's no proof against, against the existence of God, any more than there is for the existence of God. So I don't think there's a problem with it. Uh, my politics are Marxist. I am not a Christian. I shared John's uh, fascination with the study of religion. religion. Um, I practice Buddhist meditation. I attend social, mainly social gatherings, but occasionally rituals of pagans in uh, Lancaster. Um, I asked one pagan, are the, gods, um, are the gods our projections, or do they exist independently of us? His reply to me was, the gods are our projections, and don't let anybody tell you anything else. But some of the other pagans do think that they encounter Odin and Thor as beings existing separately from themselves. Uh, but my question to John is, well, might he be able to give us a book on the atheist religions of Jainism, Buddhism, Taoism, and the Samkhya philosophy? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I thought what John said was about Leonardo da Vinci was kind of very fascinating, and I'd like to find out more about it, And because I don't really know. But, I mean, it was really interesting. But I'm not... I, don't, I, think, I just think simply to look at the change in attitudes to religion and conflate together the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Enlightenment is actually shoving an awful lot together in, quite a, in, a, in a rather sort of shorthand sort of way. Because I think on the one hand, you've got what you talked about about Da Vinci, but also if you look, about, look at people like Copernicus or Galileo and people like that, they obviously are believers in God at the same time that they are sort of breaking frontiers in terms of their sort of scientific discoveries. And, you know, the fact that Galileo carried on saying he was a good Catholic even when he was being repressed for, for what he observed through the thing and you, you, I think you have got a clash of ideologies in terms of the fact that he's saying basically observation is actually the truth you know, in terms of what you can see and that was what they were denying but I think there's also things about people's world view and I think it also relates to sort of changes in the economic structures of society so if you look at people like um, well, I'll, take, I'll take John Milton as the example as a poet but I think that whole generation of the revolutionaries and the, in, in the English Civil War they saw their politics through religion, I think, in a very crucial way. You look at, I mean, you look at Milton, and he talk, when he talks in Paradise Lost about justifying the ways of God to man, and he sees the English Revolution and the victory over the um, over, Char oh, over Charles I, the abolition of monarchy. In, you know, he sees his politics through entirely religious terms, and I think you can see that if you look at the tenure of kings and magistrates and stuff like that. But it, it's a, it's, you know, it seems to me that is very different from an Enlightenment view, which you get 100 years later, when you don't, you're not actually seeing things through through that same kind of religious prism at all. So I, th I, think, I think you sort of need to kind of refine your arguments around the Reformation and the Renaissance and actually tease out. And also in particular, I think, with something like that kind of period in the, the lead up to the Civil War in this country, you know, with the growth of the sort of bourgeoisie, the growth of the sort of market economy in London, how that brought all sorts of other expectations around politics and around society into things as well. And I think that in itself comes up against, most obviously in that case, the divine rule of kings. So just some ideas around that. I don't know if I can do this in three minutes, but I wanted to do two things. Uh, first, I wanted to say something about the Renaissance and e Engels and so on, but then I also wanted to say something in response to the first speaker, Mary Black. Uh, and if I can do both, I'll be lucky. Um, the, in response to, to Mary and so on, I want to say, she says, is it all right to? Are you allowed to? Uh, is it okay to be a socialist and to think God? And so on. Of course it is. Absolutely. Can you be a socialist and be religious? Of course you can. Is there a problem with it? No. Except one thing. It's not true. <laughs> You're allowed to, but it isn't true. <laughs> now, that's not, you know, everybody has every right to take whatever view they have, but one also has the right to say, I'm sorry, it's not true. And it's not true that there is, a, quite apart from the historical gods that have emerged, and which Marx explains as being a product of the development of society and projections by human beings because of their alienation and suffering, that there is somewhere else a deeper 
other god that's immune to those criticisms. That is, that is not true. The god of Tillich or the god of somebody else is not uh, an exception to that rule, in, in, in my opinion. Uh, right. So I, 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 I want to say that. I think that all the different gods and religions are things that have a social history to them uh, and they are all a product of the alienation and the suffering and the exploitation that, 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 that people have. Okay, enough on that. Second, uh, the second point, very interesting, I think, the whole question about the Renaissance. I want here the same article that uh, John Rose was uh, mentioning. I really want to recommend to people because I don't think people read it because of the title. It's, it's called An Introduction to the Dialectics of Nature. You think, but it's by Frederick Engels, but it's absolutely fascinating article on the origins of science and in terms of understanding the art and culture of the period. It deals with that. He says uh, of the Renaissance and the Reformation that this was the greatest revolution in the history of mankind up until till that, that time. And he explains how those who paved the way, this is to do with the birth of capitalism within feudalism. He talks about how the people who paved the way for the rule of the bourgeoisie didn't suffer from bourgeois limitations. They were both artists and scientists uh, and so on. And what I think is going on in terms of generally is this, that at this period in history, and you have had for centuries, where religion in Europe, Catholicism, is the overarching framework within which all culture develops. Right, so whether you're talking about Dante writes the Divine Comedy, Chaucer writes the Canterbury Tales of uh, Pilgrims and so on, the artist is, is mostly commissioned by the church and so on. But within that you get, with the beginnings of the bourgeoisie, the rise of humanism and the humanism expresses itself within the art and you get the rise of science to which the bourgeoisie is uh, uh, allied and all of this emerges within this overall religious framework. And so you get a lot of paintings like the Virgin of the Rocks, but a lot of other ones which have ostensibly religious subjects with quite different things going on in them. So, for example, with Michelangelo, you have paintings of religious subjects which are quite, obviously, if you look at them in any other than a dogmatic religious framework, uh, are, are paintings about homoerotic desire. <laughs> Plainly, if you, if you look at them, if you, if you, if you look at a lot, a lot of his sculptures. So there's that contradiction going on right through the, 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 the culture uh, of that time. And I think that, therefore, the, what we're saying about Leonardo and the science of Leonardo and so on is part of a general feature uh, uh, of, the, of the whole period of the Renaissance, which then opens on to the, the Enlightenment and further development. God, I managed to get through past it. I see, like, no problem with um, looking for, like, a deeper meaning to life and all of that, but the actual practical kind of application of that and how that functions is it, like, we don't concentrate on our living conditions. We, we focus on, like, this metaphysicality that doesn't really matter, like, to life. It distracts people from, like, what needs to happen, which is for man in a sense, like, to become God, to be the supreme creator of his own life in a collective sense and, like, improve, yeah, and initiate, like, in a, well, in my opinion, like, a Marxist, whatever, society. But, yeah, that's about it. Hi. Um, I'm Bridget Parsons from Birmingham. I really <coughs> welcomed that this meeting. I thought it was really, really helpful because I wouldn't have thought, like, 20 or 30 years ago that we needed to develop an, an ability to historically analyse religion because I thought it, you know God was dead and we didn't need to but we do need to and I think in Birmingham we've got into quite a, a muddle over this whole thing about Marxism and religion because of course it's fantastic we work with religious people we've had religious people joining the party and that's fantastic but I think then there's a sort of feeling we can't talk about it because that's going to alienate people and I feel we do need to talk about it not the first time somebody comes to a meeting or the first time you meet somebody but I would feel like after two or three years in the party, people who are religious would have their ideas challenged. Because like, as was said, you know, God, you can believe in God, but it isn't true. And we're Marxists and we don't believe it's true. And we have a position in Birmingham where, you know, we've had people converting to becoming religious, Islam, and, and maybe to being Christian. And I think that's an issue. And I think we're afraid to talk about it because uh, we don't want to seem Islamophobic or, or anti-religious, which I think is a mistake. And I think that this, you know, the ability to talk in this way about religion and the roots of it is really, really important. And I hope that in Birmingham we will be able to take this back into our branches and, and begin to have a proper, mature discussion about it rather than just avoiding the subject altogether, which I think is what has happened. And I think that's been really, not really very good for the party. Um, 
John started off by saying we've gone from many gods to one god and then towards no god at all. I want to take issue with this sort of like many gods to, to, to one god. Because if you look at the book you've got there by Karen Armstrong or any books on the history of God that are around, they all take that line, many god to one god, and they're all written by religious people, right? And they sort of, it's in the Abrahamic tradition. So they tend to see, um, right, there might be different faiths, but they're all worshipping the one God. They might have different ways of worshipping, but it's, it's one God. Now, I think if you look at the Christian God, if you look at the Islamic God, and I think look at the um, Judean God, I think you're dealing with different gods. I don't see how the Christian God, who has sent his son to earth, is compatible with Allah as the Islamic God. I don't really see how that is compatible with um, Jehovah or Yahweh, which is the Jewish God. So this tradition of going from sort of w uh, many gods to one God has happened within religions, religions themselves. And I actually think a, a, a historical materialist analysis, would, would you'd start from the premise that all gods are man-made, right? Societies, all, all societies have had the characteristics of cr people have created gods. You can look at the Nordic gods, you can look at the Greek gods, you, look at, you can look at the Roman gods, you can look at the Christian god, you can look at the Judean god, you can look at the Islamic god. Creating gods is a feature of human society and Marx tried to analyse why it is that people have this need through alienation to actually cr create gods. So I actually think uh, a historical materialist analysis would get away from the way the religious writers have written and said, oh, it's all many gods to one god, although that's part of it. There's a much more complex history to be written about how societies have, have, have actually created God. Because you see, I think that we'd end up by saying is that for people who believe in God, we agree with them on a large part. They agree that all the other gods that have been created throughout history have been created by man. But there's one that they don't think has been created by man. <laughs> We could go one step further and just say, look, all gods are created by man. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, um, I've kind of got something like a theory and then something like a question. Um, so the theory is uh, specifically relates to some of the stuff that I'm interested in at the moment. You brought up the topic of nature with regard to what you were talking about. Um, and I was quite interested in moving the debate about religion to as contemporary as possible with regard to the question of nature. Um, because we're seeing a period of, of human history. Sorry, we're seeing a period of human history where, like, the. Sorry, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Can I get an extension? <laughs> um, we're speaking. We're, we're, we're in a situation where we're seeing the relationship between human beings and nature becoming incredibly stark in terms of the asymmetry between the two and the fact that human productivity, human technology, human advancement is creating a situation in which. There is no longer this kind of sense of there being a kind of strict, separate nature that is completely divorced from our own interventions. Um, I mean, as, as a kind of example, I was at a talk with a geologist who's working on some stuff who was talking about if you take the biomass of the entirety of the Earth as 100% biomass and you divide it up by different kind of collections of species, human beings are something in the region of 40%. The wild animals that you see running around, wildebeest and gazelles, is about 5%. So we're talking this kind of, the image of wildness of the wild is very small. Um, in this period also we're seeing the repercussions of that kind of dominance of nature to some regard that human beings now have, where we're seeing um, climate change, catastrophes, disasters coming at rapid rates across the world. At the same time, there's a, I think there is also, a, I don't know, maybe it's a, a unsubstantiated, I think there's also a sense of a kind of millenarianism emerging within religions across the world, of a kind of sense of a, a, a doom or an apocalyptic scenario emerging where kind of a lot of religions seem to be taking on a sense of millenarianism in some ways. And I was wondering whether you think there's a, a, there's a correlation there between the actual material relationship that human beings have with, with nature changing and a kind of struggling and a fear and an anxiety about that that's expressing itself in the form of the ways in which certain religions are changing now and the way they emphasise certain kind of scenarios and problems as being the most current ones in terms of their religious orthodoxy. 
So I was wondering if, uh, just kind of interested in you talking about the relationship of religion with things like, and the, the understanding of God with nature in terms of the current situation of human relationship with nature, which is mediated through the question of climate change and catastrophes and all that kind of stuff. So. Right. Um, um, I'm a member of um, uh, a shul in Edinburgh, um, a member of liberal Judaism. Um, liberal Judaism um, believes that the Torah uh, was written by human beings. Um, the emphasis that we tend to have is on um, ethical conduct. Um, I think that um, you know, all religions are um, an attempt by human beings to um, have a, to get a sort of unified sense of um, well, a theory that strings everything together. Um, I would just like to say something about um, Viktor Frankl, uh, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning, um, after being in the concentration camps. Um, Um, also, I just like I just want to share a couple of thoughts. Really, I mean, there was a, a drama on BBC that was uh, written um, called uh, "God on Trial," and they put God on trial and said, um, "You know, uh, is God guilty?" Or you know, or, so anyway, all the prisoners they held a, like a, a Bethdin, a, a rabbinical court. Uh, they found God guilty, and then they said, "What do we do now?" As they were being marched to the gas chambers, and uh, they said, "Pray." Um, I think that the, you know, the search for meaning that we all have is, is something that is innate to human nature um, and also a search for um, the sublime um, and I think that you know, speaking personally uh, my religious experience uh, ties in you know, with my ethics uh, I mean if we look at the right now we're facing the biggest crisis ever um, but in the Torah there was a thing about um, after seven years, the, the, the Jubilee, seven times seven years, 49 years, everybody should go free, all debt should be cancelled. So this was like a, a blueprint of, I mean, if we could have a debt Jubilee now, then because they foresaw that a, a, a situation like this, where there would be, um, we would all be enslaved by debt. Uh, so this, I mean, this, this should inform us, but um, I'd just like to agree with the lady that, I mean, like Man said that, well, you know, it's fine for socialists like myself and, and the lady that spoke before to, um, to believe in God, but, um, you know, my idea, my conception of God is, is, is unique to me, you know, you can't dismiss it out of hand. Um, something deep inside or when I engage in, in, in religious practice, um, brings me closer to who I want to be as a human being, um, brings me closer to seeing other people as people that uh, are, I'm united with, um, and that everything, you know, it's a way to make sense of the world, um, in the same way that Marxism is a way to make sense of, of, the, uh, of the economy. So that's just what I'd like to share with you. And uh, as Viktor Frankl said, um, the thing is, you know, not to get tied up in these questions, but the thing is to do, to actually go out there and do stuff. Don't think about, don't sit at home complaining about the Conservative government. Go out in the street and start telling people what they're doing. I work for a disability rights campaign called Black Triangle. And what I try to do is go out and educate every single person and make them face up to what's being done in their name. And that is to deprive sick and or disabled people of their fundamental human rights. And um, so all of this, I don't think that, as the lady said, well, we have comrades in the party who are, who are converting and to different faiths. I don't think that is an issue. I don't think, you know, really, I don't think that's a big deal. You're an atheist, fine. Um, you know, I believe in, in Hashem. You know, uh, the other lady believes in Jesus. That's fine. We need to concentrate on the challenges that we are faced with. And the challenges we are faced with is the destruction of our welfare state, the destruction of our National Health Service, the loss of uh, 700,000 public sector jobs. That's what we need to, 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 to concentrate on. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Um, I thought uh, John's analysis was really interesting when, uh, when he was looking at, in a sense, the, the move from the um, uh, multi-gods to one god being, in a sense, a strategy of those people who wanted to unite 
an empire in the ancient times. Uh, but what's come out really quite strongly um, from this meeting so far, from a number of the contributions, um, is that there is something, some people certainly feel that there is something within, an impulse. And I think as, uh, as a Marxist, we have to be absolutely clear of where that comes from. I think you can be a socialist and religious. I don't think you can be a Marxist and religious because it is a science. And I think what we have to recognise is that there is something inside people, but that isn't about God. And this kind of came home to me really strongly in the World Cup, actually, watching the football, Euro 2012, <laughs> where you, all the imagery it used of the, you know, the, what you call it, the, the big, uh, the cup that they hold up with all the rays of light. I think what that was appealing to was the, the sense in people that they want to be part of greater whole. We are social beings. We want to be part of a collective endeavour. And I think that feeling that people feel inside them, that they're interpreting as coming from God, is actually a very deep human instinct to be part of a collective. And I think, in a sense, how people interpret that is less important. I think you're right. If people want to call themselves whatever they want to call themselves, that's absolutely fine. Uh, but I think what we need to tap into is that sense in people that, yes, we have, to, we have to work together for the greater good of the collectivity. But we have, as Marxists, we have to recognise where that impulse comes from, not see it as superstition, but as Marxists, recognise that there's a material basis for that, and that's in the, uh, the social instinct that's deep within us. Uh, yeah, uh, following on the previous speaker, um, John talked about the way that religion was used uh, by, you know, by empires to, to unite them. And in that, uh, somebody else talked about how uh, man creates gods. Well, actually, it's different people create gods and different classes create gods. And I, I think the person referred back to the English Revolution, it, quite interesting, because if you look at the English Revolution, there were groups of people using religion against the established religion. You look, you look at what the London crowd was doing in the middle of, uh, of, of the revolution. They hated the bishops. It's a bit like the bankers today. We hate the bankers more than capitalism in general. They hated the bishops more than they hated the aristocracy. In other words, they were using their identification, their, their, you know, the context, uh, religious. They had a religion for themselves which they were using as a class battering ram against the ruling class. And you look at people like the, the, the diggers, you know, who were the sort of first communists. They talked about how the land was given to humanity by God, not to you know, one tiny class of people. In other words, they were turning it against the establishment. And in that sense, I think you can see, and that's part of the history of God. There's God, you know, they use God, and oppressed people have had their own type of version of religion. And I think you can see that in, in Islam today. You know, there's an oppressive imperialism coming from the West, and so people cling to and try and use Islam against, uh, against that. But we are not in 1642 anymore. We're in the 21st century, and I think we need to, to you know, as John was doing, see the way that, that uh, we moved on from many gods to one to none. Um, well, we've kind of spoken a lot about how there's like a social need to create a god and about um, the movement from many gods to a singular god as being a social construct and, and, and needing in society to make that, that movement for whatever reason. Um, I was also kind of just thinking on, on a topic like the idea that within many kind of um, multi-god religions and um, pagan religions, um, there were these big goddess figures, you know, the mother figures. Um, and through this movement from polytheism to uh, monotheism, we've lost the goddess. And I was just wondering if there was like what the social reason for that might be. You know, like, is that something that we, ha we haven't discussed that yet? So is that to do with... with um, you know, the creation of, of, of the family and the, the settling down of, of, of people. And, you know, if you, you look at Engels' term of what created the family, is that move um, to kind of more stable agricultural levels also associated with this kind of loss of the, the mother goddess? Uh, yes, I mean, obviously, just to reinforce the point that uh, I think Marxists are prepared to work with people of faith and no faith in terms of any particular struggle. But I think it is important to be clear about the nature of religion and the question of alienation, the way in which human beings project uh, their powers into some alien force that is over and above them, remains true of all forms of religion. Although, of course, people express that in very contradictory ways in the way that people are describing that, you know, if you look at black churches in America, clearly 
that was used as a way of taking the religion of the oppressor and turning it against them. You have that kind of contradiction. But in a sense, it doesn't abolish the central problem, which is that you remain with religion with a notion of something that is over and above you, something that is, you are ultimately uh, enthralled to. Um, and if you think about making sense of the world, the difference, I think, between making sense of the world in a religious sense and making sense of the world in a Marxist sense is this. With making sense of uh, the world in a Marxist sense, we want to be able to change the world so that human beings run it for themselves. And that notion of self-emancipation, in which we need neither God nor Caesar, to use the words of the international, become absolutely central. So, of course, we want to work with anybody, but we have to recognise that there is a problem uh, with religion because it doesn't allow for that particular point to be made. It's only in the context of the fight for human emancipation, which human beings come to run the world in themselves, that that becomes important. And I think then, in terms of the history of art and so on that people have been talking about, interesting when Jane mentioned the question of Milton, I think Christopher Hill made the point at some stage that uh, the notion of religion in Milton is actually the last stage before actually religion becomes superfluous, because at that stage, religion is becoming an internal rationality, a kind of sense of reason, and once you've done that, you don't really need the whole apparatus. Of course, because of Milton's position and so on and so forth, he's within that, and therefore you get the complex and rich contradictions that work in terms of that religion. I think that's true of the kind of way in which art develops in the Renaissance period. Gradually, if you like, the framework for God, it remains there, you can see it in Shakespeare, for example, but in sense of the drama of human, uh, of human powers fighting one another, that ceases to really be religious, and that's, I think, the important thing that we see there. So what we see, and when we're responding to religious art, is that sense of the different powers that human have, peoples have, in terms of the contradictions, the way they fight it out, but also the sense of the potentiality which is not yet realised, the beauty, the sublimity, all those kinds of elements that then become important. Just finally, I think Nick more misunderstood the notion of many gods versus uh, one god. It's not a way of trying to justify religion. It's a way of saying that in a particular kind of society, many gods make sense, whereas in societies where you want to have a unified territory or a unified area for trading or whatever it is, a single god becomes more important. But then it kind of raises all the other questions I've been mentioning. Uh, hi, my name is Jason and I'm a student. I just want to make my point very brief because I know other people would like to speak. Uh, for people that are talking about God and Marxism, um, once you believe in God that has been abstracted from nature, you are rejecting dialectics and dialectics is at the heart of Marxism. Once we abstract a God from nature, we uh, create something called a concrete, yet abs an abstract even, yet concrete realm for ourselves, which alienates our minds because this God that we have created has been created by us, but yet still we cannot transcend this God. We cannot understand this God. And therefore, if this God has created us as humans and created everything we understand, we therefore, by <coughs> believing in this God, cannot believe or think or understand the true nature of ourselves. And what that does, in turn, is it stops us from uh, knowing or believing the fact that it is us that impacts on our nature, nature uh, impacts back on us, and we shape our own human nature. And the belief in God, who is abstracted from nature, is idealistic and it prevents the dialectic and it sets us a limit which cannot be transcended because this God who is all-powerful and all-knowing cannot be transcended, which means that we cannot reach the full potential of our, you know, our human capacity. And that belief in God stops us from being scientific and constantly searching for questions because if the questions are only answerable by God, uh, what is the need for us to keep questioning it? Hi, you'll have to bear with me if I stumble over things a little bit. I didn't come prepared to speak today, but I just decided to, and I'm scared of it. Um, I'm Liz Jolly, I'm from Birmingham. Um, I'm one of the religious people that's joined the party lately. Um, <laughs> I'm not in the same branch as, as, as my comrade, um, so perhaps her experience is a little different from mine. Um, I constantly get challenged about my faith. In fact, it happened the first meeting I went to, and I welcomed it. Um, I don't think Marxists should feel uh, like they can't challenge people about their faith and have a debate about that as much as you'd have a debate about anything. Um, I do think that flatly asserting that God doesn't exist just because it was the presumption of Marx and Engels is not a political argument. Um, 
It, it isn't. So, it, I mean, if you want to talk to me about my faith, go for it. I love it. But, like, don't just flatly assert things. Give me a political reason, you know? Um, so... I think Marx and Engels were great uh, critics of the Enlightenment and all of that, and I am not an expert. Um, I've only been in the party for a year, so bear with me again. But we, they are also products of their time, and I think we have to be careful of adopting an imperialist attitude that the, the majority of the world, which does have some kind of faith, are somehow more primitive, um, and that the progression from a faith position to a non-faith position is somehow a forward motion um, because you'd find people globally who disagree with that strongly and if we're trying to b build a global international movement that can really challenge capitalism if we're serious about being revolutionaries then quite frankly it's a divisive distraction which can be as harmful as racism um, um, in a lot of ways, my theological studies led me to Marxism. We studied Marx at theological college. We studied feminist, post-colonial readings of scripture. Um, and there are a lot of people wanting to bring the divine feminine back into um, a Christian understanding or whatever. whatever. Um, and I think that when you look at the church as well, or any other faith, you can't talk about it as one thing. Class exists in all of these religious um, setups, the same as it does anywhere. Um, so if you go to a posh rich church in a nice neighbourhood you'll get very state supportive politics, they'll mostly be praying for the Queen, it's absolutely terrifying, <laughs> you know you go to an estate church that's full of ordinary people who are predominantly working class and it's very different, I'll try and shut up in any second now um, also I don't think the, the model of moving straight from polytheism to monotheism as directly an influence of it being part of the state and all of that is exactly true, the early Christians were put to death by the Roman state for being atheists because they wouldn't accept the polytheistic Roman state religion. So again, that's more nuanced than the picture we've been presented today and it takes a lot of study and I'm going to stop talking. Um, so yeah, let's not be divided over the issue of religion um, and let's work together because what we really want to do, and this is where my faith and my socialism leads me to, is we do need to self-organise. I don't remember the Bible story where God did too much for people without asking them to do something for themselves. So whether you're Christian or not Christian or any other faith, um, we do need to self-organise and we need to get rid of this capitalism. I've uh, uh, got a, another controversial issue uh, in, a, in a talk of con controversy. Uh, if we're talking about religion, surely we should talk about politics and how that can be abused as well. Think about this, everyone. Uh, what do Jesus Christ, the Prophet Muhammad, Joseph Stalin, and even, dare I say it, George Galloway actually have in common? They're, they're, all, they're, all, they're, they're all individuals or deities or mythical figures, whatever you believe about them, who've been idealised, set up as the ideal person or a thing or goal or something that we should follow, and presented as a kind of ruling your best ideology and uh, oh you're not supposed to do anything at all to improve yourself you're just supposed to blindly follow them now that's a I'm using that sort of thing to kind of get everybody thinking it's not just religion that can automatically cause problems the same kind of problems that have been mentioned in this meeting can apply to politics too when you start talking about individuals and the cult of personality and that's something else that we should take forward and learn from too, I think. Um, just quickly on that, I mean, the SOP worked with George Gallo for a number of years, continue to work with him. Um, we think he's a very good um, militant. One thing we never claimed he was was a deity. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll put that to bed. Um, <laughs> On a more, 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 more general point, I think there is a danger of um, dogmatism that comes from Marxists a lot uh, in relation to religion. Um, if you look at the arguments, I mean, just to pull back a bit, look at arguments of um, Christopher Hitchens and uh, of others when they talk about religion. Do you feel like their, their main argument seems to be that science, the advancement of science, the ideas of um, science have disproven the idea of God? Um, that, um, you know, whether it's evolutionary theory with Darwin or through the idea of physics and stuff like that, the um, old. Um, arguments of religion are now dead, clearly disproven, and therefore it's a very backwards opinion to have to be religious, to believe in a higher power, considering all the advances we've made with science, has disproven that. Um, 
uh, I completely reject that. Actually, most Christians and Muslims accept, and um, Jews, um, any religious person, most of them largely accept um, a lot of the, um, I, I, the, the, um, the uh, ideas of science, the, the, the about of science as being, being true, whether it's evolution or other things. And um, actually, what, is it's, uh, what I f fear that um, comes from that sort of militant atheism is an idea that, you know, Catholicism or Christianity or whatever used to claim to have a higher truth. They don't. We do. We know what's going on. We know what's right. And these people are entirely wrong. That needs to be argued against. And that needs to be stopped because they're just primitive and wrong. I think the Socialist Workers Party Marxists, good Marxists, are much better, better than that in terms of um, religion. We risk the danger of saying the same thing when it comes to historical materialism. This idea that because we can, um, because we um, ha um, have um, we, we can chart back to um, um, the, the roots of religion, whether it's an alienation, uh, material circumstances that create religion. You know, we, we have this um, idea which has disproven religion. It, it, you know, God is a creation of um, humans, therefore God is just not real. And therefore, our, our idea of truth, our idea of um, reality is simply right. And so what, what, while I agree with a lot of what um, John um, Molyneux said, I do actually have a problem with somebody just saying, you can be religious and be a socialist, be religious, be a Marxist, but ultimately, it's wrong. I, I, I'm an atheist myself. I do think that religious people are wrong. The idea that you can just say religion is wrong and we are right and we have, we, we have all these books to prove it, like, give it a read. It's not good enough, in my opinion. We, we, we've, um, and to come back to the problem made from Birmingham, he's talking about there's a problem of, uh, um, problem of uh, members of a party in Birmingham um, becoming religious if there's not a debate about it. Well, have a debate about it, argue your point, but listen as well. Um, and I'll, I'll, fi I'll, finish, I'll finish on this. Um, a number of people have said, you've talked about you know, what's inside that makes us turn to religion, alienation, you know, um, alienation, you know, not knowing what's quite going on, you know, confusion, stuff like that. All those things made me become a member of the Socialist Workers' Party, become a socialist and a Marxist. So this, uh, and um, those things have pushed people towards religion as well. A alienation um, makes us believe in all sorts of things. This needs to be debated and argued. But simply to claim, we, what we have to fundamentally um, make clear is that we do not have, we simply do not know all of it. We don't know the facts, we don't know truth. We need to talk to each other, we need to listen. We, need to, we can take a lot from religion, and religious people take a lot from us. And so we need to keep open minds, comrades. Uh, first of all, for my English, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to express this in English. Well, I'll try. Speak up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, first, uh, a bit earlier, someone said that you can't be a Marxist and uh, a, religious, a religious person at the same time. And I tend to agree, and I am a re religious person and not a Marxist. I am a, I am a Danish new pack, and I was in, in, instrumental in organizing the pagan movement, but left it because they are too uh, narrow-minded and, and some racists uh, among them. But uh, I do believe the gods are... Uh, uh, real, not in uh, a supernatural sense, but uh, actually uh, my belief in them started when I studied co uh, computer science and artificial intelligence as a young uh, man, and I also studied theories of, of language acquisition, how do young, uh, uh, how do children learn language, and that changed my uh, uh, notion of consciousness, and I believe it is more of a collective thing and I see the, the gods what the gods are collective consciousnesses that, that play tricks on us. Uh, now many of my co-believers in the pagan movement have a, a problem with uh, this uh, character uh, worshipped by the Christians, uh, Jesus. I don't, I think he was a great man, he was a socialist but he was tricked, he was lured by his god and uh, I think the same happened with uh, Karl Marx, and now I'm going to say something quite offensive. I think uh, if you turn the back to that God, he will, uh, he will take you from the behind. I think he did that to Karl Marx. And I think uh, the idea of changing society through a revolution is derived from... Is, uh, <laughs> yeah. Ten seconds. Is derived from, from uh, the Christian notion of, of the coming of God's, uh, of, of God's kingdom. I think uh, Marx has uh, uh, subconsciously taken over that uh, notion. Thanks. Okay. I, I, I wanted to really come back on, on, on the question, how should socialists relate to religious people? And I think we have to be really clear here. I mean, Lenin called um, religion a private matter, but in a revolutionary party, 
the issue of religion and atheism does clash somewhat, really, on the question of a number of issues, in particular um, the question of gay and lesbian rights, on the question of abortion. Um, these issues for religious people, not all religious people, are granted, it does come into play, I think, to win people to our politics. I think you do that through struggle, through struggle by working with uh, the, these groups. And I think ideas such as uh, religious ideas can be broken down, but we don't take the, Dar uh, the um, uh, Dawkins uh, militant uh, atheist position, really. I think that is a wrong position to take for socialists. I think we welcome religious people into the party, an absolute must, but we must, I think, break down the contradictions in people's heads, and I think you win that through struggle. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, and uh, we're going to be very brief, and I asked for sort of peer review, and I'm going to give myself, based on expressions on people's faces, six or seven out of ten, not bad, carry on the good work. Um, I'm not going to answer all the points that have been answered very well, most. I'm going to take two or three points. I want to come back to Jane, that I conflated Renaissance, Reformation, Enlightenment, I did because of the time, but not just because of that. I will stand by the view in the English Civil War, both sides were religious. Christopher Hill called Oliver Cromwell... God's Englishman, and that's how, probably how he saw himself, but nevertheless, we're on Cromwell's side in that civil war, because that's the force of progress. It can't be helped. There are religious ideas in the heads of those leaders. That continues to this day. I mean, who, again, will not be moved by Martin Luther King's great speech, which is essentially an adaptation of the Moses Old Testament story, which he used completely brilliantly in the civil rights movement. Of course, it expresses, in a way, the limitations of the civil rights movement, but it was a tremendous step forward, and Martin Luther King was one of the great, to some extent, revolutionary heroes of the 20th century. So it's sometimes religious ideas are in the heads of progressive people, and we recognise and welcome that, but also understand the limitations. I want to make just two other points. Um, I thought the point about the millennial movements now and the destruction of nature and the whole ecology movement is really fascinating and requires much more explanation, uh, exploration that's possible in this meeting. It requires a meeting by itself. I do think that's a factor. I think, it's, I think people are absolutely rightly terrified of the way we, 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 superficially, we human beings, of course it's not us altogether, it is the capitalist class, it is, it is the people that control the system who are doing that, but it does give the impression that we are all collectively responsible for destroying nature and it's getting out of control. This is a terribly important point, because underlying this whole argument is the, is the decline of religion, is it related to our, our humans' general capacity to control nature. Now controlling nature isn't just isn't domination of nature, it's controlling nature in our interests, also to working alongside nature, understanding in certain respects, obviously nature is greater than we are, that's quite clear. At the same time, we've done fantastically successful in controlling nature up until this point, and we've, we've, we've come a very long way. But what's very important about the present moment and the whole uh, growth of the ecology movement is it's quite clear the way the world is at the moment this is breaking down. It's now extremely unsuccessful in the way that we're relating to nature. And it's actually a further good reason for, for a revolutionary change. Because we do want ordinary people. If ordinary people are actually in control of the world, they're much more likely to take nature more sensitively, to control it when it's in our interest, but also to work in the groove of nature. Which brings me to my last point. I don't want to go into... It's, it's, it's obvious. I, I, I'm standing by the view that Marxism is an atheism and we want to defend that as a question of principle because it is a science, but at the same time we are going to be sensitive to people who are religious who, who and okay, by definition we're going to meet, as, as the socialist movement grows, we're going to go and meet more and more people like this. I was thinking a way, how do you conclude this point? I want to conclude it in this way. We, we, we face a problem of the legacy of the Soviet Union and so-called official communism. One of the proofs that official communism was, wasn't communism was the attitude towards religion. They had to break religion, they had to destroy religion, they had to close churches. But the whole point of the way we conceive of genuine communism with a degree of self-confidence that actually practising real communism with a small c would itself make religion irrelevant. There won't be any need to use force to close churches down. It will become quite obvious that, the, in a sense, the community of non-believers are more rational, moralistic, and doing, in, in a way, providing much greater progressive moves forward than the, than the, than the community of believers that, that survive in a social society. And our view is, a bit like the disappearance of the state, the community of believers, the religious believers, will be protected and defended their rights to belief, but they will come to realise, or their children or grandchildren will come to realise, it's simply no longer necessary. Because actually commanding the resources of the world in, a, in the interest of the vast majority, and the vast majority be having ownership 
of the politics of that will in itself provide a situation where those religious beliefs become increasingly superfluous. I think there's a very fundamental principle involved in that. It's a double principle. It's about tolerance of religion on the one hand, but it's also, frankly, it's, it's, it's about the view that religion itself will disappear in a genuinely communist society.